So um, I'm super glad to be here this morning at the first ElixirConf Uruguay. Uh, I speak a little bit of Spanish. Um, si queréis me puede preguntar en español, pero yo no puedo hablar todo en español aquí. Entonces voy a intentar un poco de inglés y a ver cómo nos sale, ¿va? Um, so I speak, I'll speak in English. Um, I'm from Brazil. I'm a software engineer at Cyber Solutions. Um, we have, we manage a fleet of Raspberry Pis, and I feel like, um, is Todd still here? No, Todd's not here anymore. So I feel like we are on a trail some, of some sort of like, we are on an embedded systems trail um, because t uh, Todd talked about nerves and I'm gonna talk a little bit of how we've used OTP at Savvy to guide our um, design architecture. Um, who's here learning Elixir as a first programming language or who's here uh, considering adopting Elixir uh, in production for the first time? Right, okay. <laughs> so everybody here knows Elixir. No one here is learning it for the first time. Everybody here is working with it in production. Can you follow me? Should I speak Spanish? Okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> So when we start a new project, when we start um, a Greenfield project, we often uh, find ourselves asking a few questions like, how many modules should, I, should my application have? How, uh, which layers should I use in my application? Or how should I structure my application at all? And uh, that means that we spend uh, some time on a big, uh, a big design upfront and um, that can be harmful because if you, you plan too much up front, when you're working on a Greenfield project that you're not sure about the problem yet, you're not sure about your solution yet, how that will look like in the end, you may have a big uh, cost of change and that's what architecture is, right? So uh, what we do here, what we can do here is to use OTP as the infrastructure to guide our architecture, right? To guide our code design. And that's what uh, this is about. So when we create a, an Elixir project, we get modules, we get a few files, we get a uh, directory structure, and we get a few modules. The modules, everybody here is coming from um, is the Elixir background, but if you're coming from an OOP background, uh, you will find that modules, they're just code organization. Modules don't make sense at runtime. Modules are basically a way for you to organize your code, to organize your functions. They don't will be instantiated at runtime. They won't become singletons at runtime. You can't have a dog module where you will assign it a name to it and you'll be able to set and get and modify that because that would mean that you'd have a mutable state and mutable variables, right? So think about modules as a bag of functions that they make sense when you are planning and when you are, you are trying to communicate things to other developers. So we use modules to organize those functions so we can talk to each other as people, as humans, right? So modules are code organization until you run your code. Um, when you run your code, your modules won't be singleton, but you will have at runtime what we call processes. And processes, they are the one that will carry over your modules. They will be the one um, who will make calls, who will use your modules and just use them. They will, won't become your modules, right? So atoms, uh, sorry, so processes, they are your runtime atoms. You can think of them as the smallest unit of your runtime. So when you're thinking about your project, you should think about your modules and you should also think about your runtime. What happens when you run the project? You have processes and your processes, they have identifiers which are unique because you can have distributed clusters, you can have more than one server at some point and these identifiers will help processes to find each other, to send messages to each other. And how they do that is processes have a mailbox. So processes are our actors. Processes are 
independent people, if you say, if you mean, like they have their own memory, they have their uh, own um, mailbox, so they have, they are independent of other processes and even independent from other structures that will be in your VM, right? And they communicate through message passing like this. Sometimes I feel we, we kind of are processes, right? We are, each one of us, we are, uh, as people, we can be, if you think about the matrix, we are processes. Like, I have my memory, you have your memory. We change, we exchange messages between each other, and I can exchange messages with you. So we all are processes here, right? We are the smallest unit, unit of our um, VM, which is, I don't know, the beam, who's our supervisor, I don't know. Um, so processes, they can call many functions. Processes can use modules and call them, but won't act as them. Modules can be linked together uh, in a two-way. So you can have modules like, imagine I throw you a rope, you got that rope, we're linked together, we're bound together. If you die, I die with you, man. So don't die, please. <laughs> we can have processes monitoring each other, which means I won't throw your rope, but I watch you. So if something happens to, me, uh, to you, I want to know, right? I want to know that, but sorry, I won't follow you. And we have on the beam, we have special processes. And we are, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more uh, about them. The most famous one is the gen server. So think of OTP. We have um, a little bit of um, Erlang. We have the Erlang runtime system which has our processes. Processes are part of the Erlang runtime system, which is um, the, our foundation. Then we have um, the Bing, which is a virtual machine that will run instructions that we are writing, right, as bytecodes. And then on top of those two, we have a few libraries and we have behaviors which compose the, James, uh, the OTP, sorry. Uh, those behaviors, they are what define our OTP applications, and they can be the ones that drive our code design. So, and behavior is a, a very good word here, because when we define software, when we think about our, our programs and our solutions, we're thinking in terms of behaviors. So, what should this, um, let's say I have a, a database, what should this, uh, my application do to the database? It should do an action. It look, looks up something, it creates something, it deletes something, right? So, these are actions, these are behaviors. And we can define modules as behaviors as well. But the OTP already provides us a, a good set of behaviors. And the, the engine server, which stands for a generic server, is the most famous one, the most flexible one, right? With it, we can have the server-client interaction. And with it, we can implement almost anything, right? At runtime, please. Um, so when we use a gen server, when we implement a gen server, we are implementing a behavior. So let's say we want um, to implement a phone abstraction. So every time I start my phone, I want to, to check for a signal. And uh, before anything, I, I won't be able to receive calls and I won't be able to receive any messages because my phone has no signal. How can someone call me? I'm not available. After that, I'll be able, I'll send a message back, okay, I'm available, uh, my mailbox is empty, so please, someone send me something. And then we have asynchronous calls, we'll have synchronous calls where the caller will just wait, and uh, we have uh, a continue call, which we can use that to run more expensive processes. Uh, one thing about gen server is that it's basically a process running an inflate loop and waiting for messages. That's nothing more about that. What's good about that, it, it has a well-known API, it has a well-known behavior, it's like battle tested. So you can implement your own uh, gen server, you can have your own behavior, like it's good for learning, but if you're going to do something in production, just go with what we have. In the gen server implementation, my phone here will run on top of a process. So we will have the beam will instantiate a process, a gen server process that will be responsible for running that code. 
here, um, I think it's one of um, subtle things in a gen server um, because as an infinite loop and as we have some synchronous calls where the caller keeps waiting, like I'm calling you and then I'm waiting for your response. So you should reply something to me and I'm just here waiting, right? Um, so when I call you or when our phone is starting, we can, as soon as we receive a message, we can say, okay, as soon as we get signal, we can say, okay, I've got signal. And now me as the gen server, my phone is looking for remote messages. While it was off, did it get any message? Do you have any new messages? We do or we do not. It doesn't matter. What matters is as long as, as soon as we start our process, we want to be able to receive new messages. Um, then I think when we talk about Erlang OTP, we talk about fault tolerance, right? And when we talk about fault tolerance, we talk about supervisors. Supervisors, they are what make that happen, what, uh, what makes that possible. So supervisor, supervisors is um, a behavior. You can implement your own supervisors. Uh, and then they define how your processes will start, how your process will end, and how your process will restart based on any strategy you want. So they have a few strategies. We will, um, for the rest of the talk, we use the most common one. And they are responsible for that. So when talking about fault tolerance, we have supervisors. And they create uh, what is so well known in Erlang and Elixir, which is the, the, supervisor, the supervision tree. Um, so for the rest of this talk, um, I'm going to show you a little bit of how at Savvy we uh, use this, but I, I'm not showing, I'm not going to show you our actual application. So I, I chose to bring up to you something I like, which is coffee. Um, I'm from Brazil, I'm from Northeast Brazil, so we don't drink mate there, I'm sorry. Uh, or I, you should be saying sorry to me, right? Uh, now I'm living in South Brazil, and people there also drink mate. I don't know um, a lot about mate yet. I, I don't know about the rituals and I'm not sure about if there are any special kinds of temperature if you should uh, have to drink. I, I'm not, I should learn that probably. So talking about coffee, we have for each type of coffee we brew, we have a specific or an ideal water temperature. So if someone here likes espresso, espresso is very famous, right? Yeah, espresso are very famous. Oh, hey, I want a double espresso. Um, Pour over, it's just like when you pour the water on a paper filter, um, a, a tissue filter or something like that, like you make at home, probably your mom make, I'm not sure if you guys drink coffee at home, you, you probably should only drink mate, right? <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, so for each type of coffee, we have um, an ideal water temperature in order to brew it, right? And they have their own, um, machinery for brewing that, like French press, it's all that, you know, noisy thing that you do. I don't like that, sorry. But uh, I like espresso, I like Rover, I like Chemex. Chemex are super nice. I'm not sure if there are any cafeterias around here, so maybe after lunch we can go to have some coffee. Like, I'm sorry, but free coffee is good, but like those coffees are even better, right? So imagine we are um, a big coffee company we make coffee machines and our headquarters, our CEO wants to have a dashboard on his, at his office with a beautiful map of the world and one dot for each coffee machine we have working in production, right? That sounds like fancy and it's real time and it's everything that we want to do here today. So uh, we will have a coffee machine and we'll have a lot of coffee machines similar to what we have at Savvy with our Raspberry Pis spread across the US. And these, each coffee machine will communicate to the server through WebSockets. Who knows Phoenix here? Okay, now uh, everybody knows Phoenix, right? And uh, Phoenix provides us some real-time capabilities 
with WebSockets. And on top of WebSockets, we have channels and we have topics, we have presence and we have live view, right? Uh, you guys will see a nice talk today about live view, so I won't go into uh, the Phoenix server or the coffee server because there are plenty of resources out there and you guys will be able to see a little bit of it today, later today, right? Today, right? So let's talk about our coffee machine. Let's focus on that uh, for now, right? Our coffee machine uh, has a type because we want to configure our coffee machine to make a specific, to brew a specific type of coffee. And that coffee machine, in order to do that, we need to watch the temperature. So we need a sensor to watch the uh, water temperature and warn us when like, oh wow, it's too hot, so don't do that, something, something's broken, let's send a team, rescue team. Um, then what happens inside our coffee machine is we have a sensor. I know I draw, I draw really well, right? Who's here a designer? Like, uh, yeah, okay, so you're, you're as good as I am, right? <laughs> so we have a sensor who's watching, who's its responsibility at runtime it's to watch the water temperature, right? So from time to time, our sensor will check the water temperature and will send a message because we are, we are talking about runtime, so we are talking about processes. So our sensor process will watch the water's temperature and will send a message to the socket mailbox and the socket will be responsible for sending the message back to the server, right? We, can, we usually call push the, mes the, the message to the, the server. And uh, we have the registry here. The registry, think of it as a table, an in-memory table, which you can just go there and ask, hey, um, where's the socket? Oh, the socket is here. Here's the PID of the socket, the identifier of the socket. So uh, the sensor will be able to call the socket, right? Um, remember, modules are code organization. So when we create our Elixir project, we are only talking about code at first. We are only organizing our ideas, which won't necessarily be um, be one to one to what we have in runtime, right? So we create our uh, coffee machine project. Uh, we pass the supervisor argument, meaning that we want this uh, coffee machine to be supervised because we want fault tolerance. What we are doing here, um, so. Modules are code organization. Modules are a bag of functions. So first, we can use our configuration module to have a bunch of configuration functions, right? This is only that, organization. So I can talk to you, I can open a PR, you can open that and can see, oh, so this is all related to configuration, so it's fine. You can have random functions there, I don't recommend you uh, if you want to go uh, to production, if you want to work with other people, but who knows. So here we uh, check, we read environment variables at runtime. You could do at compile time. There are a few uh, things, I'll leave it open here so we can have ask uh, questions later. Hope you have questions. Um, so we have, uh, we, we read the environment variables here we read the machine type because we need to tell our servers from which machine is sending that temperature, right? We have a topic because our Phoenix server creates a topic and it, that's how, it's not just, hey, send to the server, it's sent to the server to a specific topic that will be waiting for messages and that topic will be responsible for creating our dashboards, our map. And we have the type. The, each machine, each coffee machine, will be configured to brew a specific type of coffee. Or mate, we should do a, a mate machine then. <laughs> um, after that, we have, after we have our configuration, let's go to our socket. So we can have a gen server as a socket. Here, I'm using a library called Slipstream. Not sure, who knows the Slipstream library? Who knows um, Phoenix client library? No? Who's ever worked with uh, WebSockets? All right, good. Um, who's ever worked with server-to-server -server communication? Nice, nice. Which library did you use? Um, it was, I used Broadway, and it's a guest 
directly. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. So if you want to make servers communicate uh, directly to one another uh, through WebSockets, you uh, won't use SQS, but you will use something like Phoenix Client or um, Slipstream. I'm not sure, I'm not aware if there are any other libraries for that. So what Slipstream does is it mimics a gen server behavior. We won't go here and create our own WebSocket libraries. We will want uh, to rely on the Elixir community. If, and, and maybe we can also um, contribute back to that library, right? That's what community is about. So our socket will start with a configuration. Basically, we will tell our socket, hey, here's the URI of the server, of the WebSocket server. It's not an HTTP something, it's like a WSS something, right? So you will connect to this URI and you will tell the registry that your PID is on this machine socket. So you, in the registry, we will basically have a tuple, a machine socket and a PID, which will be the PID for the, our uh, gen server as a socket. Then the init function will connect to the server. We will ask it to connect to the server. And here we are using, we are calling the machine config module to get the configurations, right? Because So here at runtime, we will have a socket process implementing this gen server behavior, but ca it can use and it should use different modules and uh, different functions to get the configuration. We don't want to couple that. We don't want them to get too much attached. You know, it's like a relationship. When you get too much attached to someone, you start suffocating that person, right? <laughs> So we, want, we don't want to do that. We want our socket to be free. <laughs> After we connect to the server, uh, then we assign, similar to what we have in live view, we assign variables to our socket. So it's like we are telling our gen server, hey, this will be your state now. As you're running, as you're connected, here, this will be your state, which is basically the machine ID, the type of coffee we're brewing, and the topic of the, the server we're connecting to. Then it's just like protocols. It's says this bureaucratic process of, okay, now I'm connected. The server will send back a message. Like if you're using TLS, which you should be using TLS, if you're using authentication, whatever, uh, the server will reply back and say, okay, you're connected, two thumbs up. And then uh, our socket will say, okay, now I want to join uh, a channel and I want to subscribe to this topic. And the server will say, Again, it goes again to the server and the server replies back to us and say, okay, now we join, congratulations. Our socket is running, we are connected to the server, but that's it, right? So here's another beautiful drawing. Um, so we have the server connected through the web, the web socket over a channel, subscribe to a topic. So everything here is like we build one thing on top of another thing. I think that's, that's one of the beauties of the, of the community and uh, that's one of the beauties of uh, engineering in general. That's, uh, that was our missing piece, right? We, have a, we need the sensor. And as we saw, we want the sensor to be an independent process. So we will also use a gen server and we spawn another gen server, which will from time to time send a message to itself because that's also possible. I can talk to myself, I can make a monologue. And then uh, the, the sensor will send a message to itself saying, hey, read the temperature, read the temperature, read the temperature. And that read, we can like use ports, which we won't cover, but it's like we will talk to the operating system and say, hey, is there something on my GPIO here? Uh, you saw Todd's talk, right? So you know what the GPIO is, right? Uh, so we'll, we'll ask the, the operating system underneath it to say, hey, give me the temperature through this GPIO and the sensor, the actual sensor, the nerve device Todd built, imagine he built our sensor, right? Um, that nerve device will send us a message back saying, hey, here's the temperature I just read from the water. And I say, okay, we have a temperature. Here is just a random number. Uh, and then we look up into the registry saying, hey, where is the machine socket? Because I have a temperature here which I wanna send a message to it. And say, okay, here's the socket pit if there's any, and then we send to the socket 
process a message, hey, here's the temperature I just read. And then we, we ask again, hey, in a few seconds, please send a message to myself because I want to know uh, what's the temperature of the water right now, okay? So that's a, a simple gen server. We could have done it differently. Please ask questions later. Um, so back, it, back to the socket, we have our socket receiving that message. Look that here um, on the uh, second process send, we have sent to a, a socket pad passing the sensor read atom. So in the socket, as a, a gen server defines, we have the handle info callback, which is whenever you receive a message from a process directly, run this callback, run this implementation. So when we get the sensor read, we pattern match that, we get a temperature, and then we call another module, which is the temperature module, and we say, hey, perform this check for me, please. I want to know how's uh, the water temperature based on this coffee machine type. And then it will do its trick, and depending on the response from the temperature module, we will push back to the server a message to that topic saying, hey, here's the temperature I just read from this coffee machine and um, well, just a random status, right? Then here it's our holy grail. Here it's our, the, our entire business logic is here. It's just a module, right? We're, here it's just how we process our data. Here's just how uh, we will check, what's the goal here, to check the water temperature. It's easy like that, right? And uh, as Todd was saying, uh, we have an entire AI composed of an if and an else, uh, where we just call a function to get me the max temperature for each coffee brew type. And depending on that, we will use a callback which if you've programmed on that language I don't want to talk about here, uh, you've heard about that a lot. So a callback is another function, right? And we will use that function passed as an argument to say, hey, it's okay or it's an error. So it's like there's a local warming here. And that will be run in our socket, just right here, right? And uh, you can see the, the callbacks are those anonymous functions. And what does our supervision tree looks like? So um, it's good when we are, I, I find it, uh, the supervision tree is something beautiful, I think, because it helps us visualize. I'm a very visual person, although I can't draw. Um, I find those, someone draw this for me, and I'm very grateful for the Erlang team for doing that. So this helps us visualize how our project, how our software is behaving at runtime and that matters a lot. So we have our supervisor, like the, the big, um, big duck with the big wings, right? And we have all its children beneath it. Uh, we have our registry, we have our sensor we created as a gen server, and the number up there is the socket, right? And the socket is linked by the registry, um, basically because it's the only way to find it, so it creates a link. If the registry dies, the socket will have to be reinitialized by the supervisor. Um, where's our temperature module here? It's nowhere. Because a module is just code organization. You can't see that here, right? Because it doesn't matter at runtime if our temperature, where our temperature will run, okay? Actually, it matters because our sensor is sending a temperature to a socket, right? And our socket is calling our temperature module directly. What if there was a bug in our temperature module? What if we raised an exception? What if we did, we couldn't write something and that was breaking? So if our temperature module raises an exception, throws an error, whatever a bad thing happens there, our socket will go down, our socket will crash. And if our socket crash, 
our CEO at the headquarters won't be able to see that green dot on the map. So hey, over the thousand dots we have here, this one is not blinking, why? And then it's up to you, poor developer, I'm sorry, to fix that out. So letter crash, it's a very well-known phrase when we're talking about Erlang, but just letter crash, it's not, not helpful when we have um, a bad supervision tree. So I want, I want this to, to let it crash. I want my system to crash. It's fine, let it crash, but please don't touch my socket. So in order to do that, what should we do? We can isolate our temperature module in a specific process, another special process called a task. A task will be a process that will run only that action and, and will terminate. And that's fine. We don't want any long running processes just to handle temperatures, right? So our socket will call another supervisor to spawn a handler and that handler will be our temperature handler. And if we have a bug in our temperature handler and it crashes, okay, we will, have, we will not have uh, the temperature for the water for that moment, but we will know that that machine is still working somehow, right? and our socket won't fail. Our sensor, also, it won't fail. And remember, modules are just code organization. So we've been thinking here about our runtime, and from time to time we go back to our modules, to our business logic. But we didn't spend too much time, we spent some time, like I draw those, those beautiful diagrams for you guys so you could see what we wanted to achieve what we were thinking about would happen at runtime, right? But, and we started creating modules. We started creating folders. We have the handles folder. We have a socket folder where this, um, we, have, we can have the socket configuration. We've, created, we've been creating files. We've been creating modules. But we haven't been overthinking on them, right? We've been thinking while we develop. Like, we are on the agile era, right? We won't spend too much time thinking about We'll spend a little bit of time, we will experiment on that, we'll see failures, like our handler, our temperature handler was failing, and then we'll refine our model, we will refine our architecture. And that's because we rely on the OTP. Now here's what our beautiful supervision tree looks like. So now we have, you can see we have a new line uh, on the bottom, which is the task supervisor which is responsible for spawning new uh, temperature handlers processes. That's all it will do. And when something bad happens, that's cool. The supervisor will just restart it again. And what if I told you a new socket library is on the block? So from time to time, there's a new kid on the block, right? Someone creates a new library, a faster one, um, a more readable one, more maintainable one, and uh, we want to replace our socket library, or we want, go, we want to go back to an old one, right, that we found is more stable, I don't know. It's fine, because we've built our socket, our socket gen server, isolated. Uh, our, socket, our socket gen server, it's not t attached to our machine configuration, it's not attached to our temperature handler, it's just the socket there. Right, so that's what um, some people call like hexagonal architecture, ports and adapters. So we've been do kind of doing that step by step without overthinking about that. We know these things happen. We know uh, we know about DDD. We know about hexagonal architecture layers and whatever. What uh, we will build them inter interactively, right? We will build them uh, as we need them, right? Okay. Um, that's all, and I don't think we have time for uh, questions, but the last, the last thing I'd like to uh, leave you with is like, just make good art, as the poet says, not sure if you know that phrase, uh, and preferably make good art with OTP if you can. Thank you. <laughs> time for a coffee.
<laughs> no, I was wondering why uh, you um, you had an enum random between three seconds and ten seconds whenever you send the message to check again the the temperature. Oh, it was just for fun. Ah. Like I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to see them running. Like I started okay. a few coffee machines and uh, one server, and just wanted to see that happens. Like, okay. Thank we you. are we are still on the embedded uh, embedded systems trail, so it's like uh, not very scientific. Do you have uh, a particular idea of how code organization could also handle runtime? So. You have like runtime and, and modules in the same place. Uh, everything in, in Erlang, for example, the gen server has the client API and both the runtime thing, the behavior in the same module. Do you have a particular uh, opinion on if that could be better separated somehow? Um, opinions are hard, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and having opinions sometimes can be challenging. But um, you can, I think you can split, as we say in computer science, it depends TM, right? So as if you have a complex gen server, if your gen server starts growing up, you can have, for example, a, mod, um, a module just to handle state. So imagine you want your gen server state in a struct or something, then you can uh, create this struct and have this struct in a, an external module, like, Preferably on the same folder, but uh, just to make it easier to communicate with others, but uh, on a different module. You can also um, do it uh, the public uh, API of the gen server out, but it really depends on your case. I think when it, when it's small and if you have a cohesive uh, a cohesive logic, it's good to have them on the same module. It helps readability. It helps you don't have to open three files just to understand what your gen server should do, right? Was that it, so? Okay. Thank you.